Hello and welcome to the Leadership Briefing. I have always enjoyed the opportunity of these events to look at a significant leader from the past and do our best to learn for the present. Today I'm going to be talking about always a general, Dwight D. Eisenhower in War and in Peace. Eisenhower is something of an enigma to most Americans, and it's interesting that he has receded into the background of the awareness of so many of those who are living today. But he raises in his leadership, both in the military and in politics, he raises some of the most basic questions about leadership. Is it an art or a science? I think Eisenhower, like most great leaders, would demonstrate it as both. Are leaders born or made? And uh, again, I think uh, Eisenhower demonstrates that to some extent the answer is yes, they are both born and made. But Eisenhower is one of those leaders who helps us to understand perhaps more than any other that leadership is learned. And this may be the greatest contribution of the leadership model of Dwight David Eisenhower. He was a leader who learned he had vast opportunities to learn, far more expansive than most human beings would ever expect to uh, appreciate or to enjoy. Eisenhower, as it turned out, made the most of them. But in order to understand him, we have to put him in the context of his times. And uh, I guess a part of my interest here is that Dwight David Eisenhower's time overlaps with my own. I am one of the last of the Eisenhower babies. I was born in October of 1959. So the, about the last 14 months of the Eisenhower administration were the first 14 months of my life. And uh, well, I remember them about as well. Uh, I have no personal memory other than the fact that I can't know who I am, except that my origins were in those last months, that last year of the Eisenhower era of the 1950s. And even as I look at my own pictures there in the beginning, those black and white images. I see the black and white images of Dwight Eisenhower, one of the last classic black and white photograph leaders of American history. From John F. Kennedy onward, the photographs would be far more in color. But again, that helps us to understand the times of President Eisenhower. And we are talking about the Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in Europe. We are talking about General of the Army, five-star general, Dwight David Eisenhower, we're talking about the 34th President of the United States. But in my mind, Eisenhower is fascinating as a study in leadership because he presents to us two massive questions, and uniquely so. The first is this, how did Dwight Eisenhower come to dominate an age and eventually to be the leader, a key to the defeat of the most monstrous foe of the 20th century? And then the second question is even more interesting. How did he come to dominate his age in a way that was only recognized a generation after he had passed from the scene? And that is to say that Dwight Eisenhower is now considered a far better leader than he was in his own day. In his own time, Dwight Eisenhower was considered one amongst many generals, the 34th among presidents, and when he left office, he was not highly rated as the nation's chief executive by historians. But in more recent years, he's been ranked as high as five out of the more than 40 men who have served as president of the United States. In order to answer these questions, we do have to look at the man and his times. The Eisenhower family comes from Zabruck, and they were in their ancestry back to the 18th century, a part of the great Anabaptist migration to the New World. And that meant that they came, the ancestors of who became the 34th president of the United States, came to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania as a part of that Anabaptist migration. People think of it as Amish country, and it is, Amish and Mennonites. And the Eisenhower family was a part of the River Brethren branch of the Mennonites. Now, eventually, Dwight, Eisenhower would become the third of seven sons of David and Ida Eisenhower. And it's interesting to note that Dwight David Eisenhower is the son of David Dwight Eisenhower. And it was the father David who took his family from Lancaster County, they're kind of the heartland of the Anabaptists in the United States, the Amish and the Mennonites. And it was Eisenhower uh, who was born in Texas, Denison, Texas, N neither in Pennsylvania, where anyone would have expected him to be born in that family, or in Kansas, where actually uh, 
Dwight Eisenhower grew up with the rest of his brothers and his family in Abilene, Kansas, a town which is mostly famous for having been the place of the childhood and the growth to adulthood of Dwight Eisenhower. He grew up on the American heartland, and there is probably no city in America that better represents that American heartland than Abilene, Kansas. So it was a trek from Zarbrook in Europe for the Eisenhower family, and then eventually through successive generations to Dwight Eisenhower in Abilene, Kansas. But no one would have assumed then that Dwight Eisenhower was born to greatness. First of all, he was one of seven boys, and secondly, he was in Abilene, Kansas, and there was nothing to predict that he would one day write astride history and stand in the course of great human events, much less to, to lead them. Well, as you think about Dwight Eisenhower in this period, recognize that he's being formed by his parents. They were both strict disciplinarians. Uh, they were a religious family, and that's the very word that Eisenhower used. There were Bible readings and devotions in the morning and in the evening, according to the Mennonite practice. But Dwight was not understood as a boy to be a particularly uh, religious young person. But he was active, physical, and ambitious. But he wasn't ambitious in the way that you would think of him later as Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe, as a five-star general, or as a President of the United States. But he was ambitious to do something that he couldn't do in Abilene, Kansas. And he, on the other hand, had very little family means to launch him into some kind of professional career. He had a friend who told him that his own plan was to go to the Naval Academy because there was no tuition. But Eisenhower, due to the work that he did after high school, was actually too old to be admitted to the Naval Academy. But he found out he was still young enough to be admitted to West Point. And so, in one of those turns of history that turns out to be providential, Dwight Eisenhower went to West Point because he was too old to get into the Naval Academy and too poor to go anywhere else. And he went to West Point and he found himself there. And of course, this was in the period that uh, was leading up to America's involvement in what would become known as the First World War. And so as you're looking at Dwight Eisenhower, the young man graduating from West Point in the class of 1915, you have all these young men who are now looking at war that is tearing the world apart in Europe and wondering if America will get there. And then eventually, wondering not if, but when Americans will get there. And Dwight Eisenhower fully expected, intended, and wanted to be there. But he graduated in that class of 1915. And uh, even as the Allied Expeditionary Force undertook action as America entered the war, and remember, America was active on the battlefield in World War I in Europe only really for a matter of months. But they were decisive months. And out of that, America emerged as the great world leader. But to his frustration, Eisenhower was sent to staff duty and mostly spent his time training, even serving as a football coach. As many of his biographers and as Eisenhower in his own memoirs reflected, uh, he was unfortunately successful as a football coach, which meant that commanding officers didn't want him to stop coaching football. But that really isn't what he wanted to do. Instead, he wanted to fight, and he wanted to lead in battle. But here's a very interesting thing. Of that class of West Point of 1915, that graduating class, 58, indeed, by one count, 59 of those graduates would become general officers, eventually generals of one rank or another in the United States Army. That's an extraordinary percentage, so much so that that class has been defined as the class the stars fell on, as in the stars of a general. But that appeared so unlikely after World War I that the United States military has to be recognized as entering its lowest point of the 20th century. That requires some explanation. After the mobilization of so many young soldiers for World War I, and uh, after America made the decisive difference, it has to be said, in the victory in World War I, it became very clear that Americans were not ready for their nation to emerge as a great military power worldwide. Now, this has often been described as isolationism, and in some cases, especially later in the 1930s, isolationism would be an accurate description 
But it really was an unwillingness on the part of Americans to see their still relatively young nation as a great player on the world scene. That wasn't their self-image of the United States. And thus, they did not see the need for a vast American military, and particularly a standing army. And so they cut military expenditures so radically that by the time you get to, say, 1936, 37, 38, the United States has a military that by some count ranked the 17th largest in the world. And it was often compared with the military size of Belgium. And as one historian put it, that ranked the United States just under Portugal in terms of its military size and its expenditures on military. And this was a bitter political issue, but it was also a bipartisan political issue. At this point in those decades between those two world wars, America did not see itself as an imperial power. It did not see itself as a power on the world stage, and it did not see itself as needing a big military. Now, that meant that an awful lot of the young men who went to West Point and the other military academies and were looking for a, a long-time career serving their country in the military, many of them had to face the reality that there was no real future for them. Now, just to give you one example, and we'll talk about this when we think about the virtues of Dwight Eisenhower, the man we eventually knew as General Eisenhower, indeed General of the Army Dwight Eisenhower, spent 16 years as a major. 16 years. And uh, there were years during which you had all these young officers basically decide, and as they were approaching middle age, and, uh, and some of them getting even older, some of them reached the point that they figured out there was no future in the military for them, and so they entered into private work and left the military. And so there was a thinning of the ranks at one point, even amongst the, the graduates of West Point and the other academies who were serving in the military. But we need to ask a question. What was really going on with Dwight Eisenhower during all of those years? Well, here's what was going on with Dwight Eisenhower. He was serving in a lot of posts that no one would ever remember in history. He was serving at a lot of places, both in the United States and beyond, where the postings were neither prestigious nor, again, memorable. He was serving in a situation in which the Army appeared to be planning to do very little for a very long time in the future. But what Dwight Eisenhower did, or what history did in the life of Dwight Eisenhower, was to place him in a close relationship with four of the most significant generals in the history of the American Army. And those four were Fox Connor, John J. Pershing, Douglas MacArthur, and George C. Marshall. For every single one of them, Dwight Eisenhower was a key staff officer. He rose to prominence and to the attention of these commanders because of his extraordinary organizational ability. Now, here's something to think about. When we think about leadership now, we think about organizational ability. It just makes sense to us that a leader has experience in the organizational leadership and understands how to organize. But we have to put this in the context and realize that that was really an emerging understanding of leadership. If you went back uh, a matter of, uh, say, even just a few decades, even in American military history, the, uh, the quintessence of leadership was charisma and personality. Just think of you know, people like George Armstrong Custer. And, and you, you just think of the fact that the people were remembered because of their personality and their charisma. And of course, a lot had happened in the world, just in terms of even the vast size of the armies. But as you think going backwards in history, you will remind yourself that many of the greatest military leaders, such as Napoleon, were indeed organizers who understood logistics. They understood the importance not only of manpower, but of materiel. And Dwight Eisenhower emerged as someone who could train officers and understood how to get that done. Someone who could get troops ready for action and get troops uh, rightly assigned to their responsibilities. He, he became known as someone who could, well, as would be said of others later, make the trains run on time. And in the military, that was an organizational skill that, skill that stood out. The, the second thing was, he had a warm personality that, uh, that meant that he made more friends than enemies, which in any context is an advantage, but in the military, over a period of time, was a big advantage. And it turned out, and this is key for history with Dwight Eisenhower, turned out he could work with extremely prickly personalities. 
And you mentioned especially names like Douglas MacArthur and, uh, well, George Patton, or later, Bernard Law Montgomery. You have to figure out that Dwight Eisenhower can only do his job. And he did his job so well because he knew how to deal with very difficult and extremely strong personalities. Fox Connor was the first general to which Eisenhower was attached and from whom he learned so much. Fox Connor is not so well known, except to military historians, but his influence on other general officers, especially those who had fight in World War II, was absolutely massive. Eisenhower served with him uh, beginning in 1921 when Fox Connor became the commanding officer of the 20th Infantry Brigade in Panama, and Eisenhower would serve with him for three years. Fox Connor, who would reach the rank of Major General, recognized in Eisenhower the makings of a great leader. No one knew what was in the, the horizon of history, but he, he saw in Eisenhower the material of a great leader, except he saw Eisenhower as lacking in something very important, and that was the knowledge of history. And so Fox Connor, taking Eisenhower under his tutelage, taught him to read history, and in particular, military history. And uh, so much so that Eisenhower would later say that he really was made as a, a general eventually by reading the military history that had been assigned to him by Fox Connor. Uh, this became very key to Eisenhower's understanding of leadership. Leaders are made by reading. Now, there's more to it than that, but Eisenhower would say there's not less to it than that. You, you have to absorb vast amounts of material and background and knowledge of history in, in order to know your place, not only in history, but in leadership. But Fox Connor was important for a, another reason. You remember that the, the posting was in Panama. Fox Connor understood international relations in a way that was very rare for an American general. And he understood war as war was developing in the 20th century. He had three military maxims that he taught to all who worked with him. Eisenhower picked up all three, and you will hear all three of these in Eisenhower's leadership of World War II. Number one, never fight unless you have to. Axiom number two, never fight alone. And axiom number three, never fight for long. Uh, those three maxims were very key to Eisenhower's understanding of how to defeat Nazi Germany in World War II. And of course, it was Eisenhower's ability, as we shall see, as uh, one who could create this great allied military effort in the European theater that became key. But how that was done was also a matter of fascination to Fox Connor, who said, if indeed you have to work with allies, then power is not enough. Persuasion becomes key. And again, Eisenhower picked that up. And when you look at his legacy, both as the Supreme Commander in Europe and as President of the United States, it is his ability to persuade that Eisenhower understood, as taught by Fox Connor, was key to leadership. Now, uh, by the way, Pershing, uh, when he was Chief of Staff of the Army, wanted Fox Connor to replace him, but uh, that didn't happen. Instead, Douglas MacArthur replaced him. But before we get to MacArthur, we have to get to Pershing himself. Uh, Pershing, the most famous general, of course, of the American forces in World War I, who was the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces on the Western Front. He, uh, he is known not only for being a, a decisive and victorious general, he's also known uh, for his absolute insistence that when Americans are involved, the American army is involved, it is involved as the leadership unit, independent of the command of other nations. Now, that was considered arrogant during World War I, but it was key. It was absolutely key. America would not have the posture it has in the world today if the United States had allowed its soldiers to be put under a European command in, uh, in 1918 and uh, in 1917 when the effort began to mobilize the Americans for war. Well, during the time that Eisenhower worked for Pershing, he accomplished what would probably now be considered something insignificant and boring, and that is that uh, after World War II, he was issued responsibility to catalog and record for history all of the American battle monuments that would be placed in Europe in honor of American valor in World War I. Now, that sounds like a minor footnote to history, but it, it accomplished two things. Number one, Eisenhower did his job extremely well, producing a volume of several hundred pages documenting the entire plan. But it also meant that he worked closely with General Pershing. 
and eventually became so close that uh, he helped Pershing writing his own memoirs. Well, here's something, again, that becomes very apparent in Dwight Eisenhower. When he was dealing with every single one of the commanders for whom he worked, he impressed them for his ability to get the job done and more, and quietly, and uh, if not happily, then at least uh, cooperatively and persuasively. During these years, Eisenhower also, just languishing in that that army that was itself languishing, was trying to figure out whether he would stay in a career in the army or would have to go elsewhere. But he had the opportunity to uh, attend the Command and General Staff College as a major, by the way, and he did and learned a great deal there. And he also attended the Army War College. But all of that appeared to be something of a learning opportunity that might never be uh, used or deployed in the context of war. Still a major. He was then assigned to serve as an aide to General Douglas MacArthur. And MacArthur also had been Army Chief of Staff. And during that time he was Chief of Staff, Eisenhower worked for him in the latter period and then went with him to the Philippines, where very famously, uh, Douglas MacArthur went to the Philippines to try to create a professional army there in the Philippines. The Americans had figured out that in the Pacific theater, with a war with Japan looming, that the Philippines would be absolutely key. Uh, Douglas MacArthur himself developed a, a personal identity with the Philippines and eventually became a field marshal in the Philippine army. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower served rather quietly but extremely effectively as an aide to MacArthur. Now, MacArthur was, uh, to choose a word rather carefully, uh, a prima donna. Uh, he was an overwhelming personality, and uh, he was not used to having an aide like Eisenhower who pressed back on him on uh, so many matters of policy. And as a matter of fact, the, again, the political context was, uh, w was very intense. And uh, Eisenhower would have to be very skillful with the Philippine government in uh, applying and uh, describing and negotiating uh, the plans that MacArthur had both for the American army in the Philippines and, and the armed forces uh, and for the Philippine army itself. Now, when you look at two figures on the world scene, Douglas MacArthur and Dwight Eisenhower, here's what's very, very apparent. Uh, as you look in the early 1930s, MacArthur is famous, was already famous, was famous from his exploits and leadership in World War I, was famous as Army Chief of Staff, was loved and hated, respectively, by different constituencies, including the White House and those in the Army who served under him. Eisenhower was by far the lesser figure. People didn't think of Dwight Eisenhower as the future, as a great leader. They did think of Douglas MacArthur. But just think of history. By the time you get to the Second World War, Douglas MacArthur would be Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in the Pacific Theater, and Dwight Eisenhower would be Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in Europe. History has very interesting twists and turns. But with Eisenhower and with MacArthur, those twists and turns would be even more interesting. And I'm going to fast forward just a moment because in 1948, Douglas MacArthur coveted the Republican nomination as President of the United States. He wanted to run against Harry Truman, even into the Republican primaries. But it didn't go well. And, of course, it was not MacArthur, but Thomas Dewey who became the 1948 Republican presidential nominee. He was defeated by Truman, famously. Just think of Truman holding up the uh, newspaper. Dewey defeats Truman. Uh, Truman is president. And uh, MacArthur recedes at that point uh, in the American mind and memory. Uh, he wanted to be president. There's no indication that Dwight Eisenhower at this stage ever thought of being president. But four years after Douglas MacArthur was hungry for the presidency and forbidden it, the presidency basically, in a very real sense, fell into the lap of Dwight Eisenhower, who was elected president in 1952. They, they described each other in very interesting terms. When Eisenhower was elected president of the United States, Douglas MacArthur quipped that Eisenhower was the best clerk he ever had. And uh, when told that, Eisenhower conceded his, uh, his debt of leadership and learning to Douglas MacArthur by saying, that he studied dramatics with MacArthur uh, for uh, several years. Um, they nonetheless, as each wrote his memoirs, said uh, very positive things about the other. 
But now we have uh, Dwight Eisenhower with Douglas MacArthur learning, but it was George Marshall who was the fourth of the great generals to whom Dwight Eisenhower was attached and from whom he learned. And of course, this is as history is changing before American eyes. The threat of Nazi Germany is now undeniable. The question is, how can America get its armed forces ready? And uh, George C. Marshall deserves enormous credit uh, as chief of staff of the army for his political skill and his military skill in getting the American military ready when the American people were not ready to pay the bills for a military, when there was the political fear that, uh, that raising a military meant that Americans would enter into war. Uh, all of this was a part of the great concern that uh, kept Americans, and this was the period that is rightly described as isolationist in many ways, kept Americans from admitting the reality of the Nazi threat and Congress and the president from dealing with it. Now, Roosevelt saw it coming and was doing what he could do to try to bring the army into larger numbers, to try to get an army ready, uh, both in materiel and in manpower. It was an arduous task, but Eisenhower was key to that task. And Eisenhower's organizational ability, again, became very, very clear. He learned lessons from Marshall, even as he had from MacArthur and from Pershing and from Fox Connor. And it was during this period that it was Marshall who helped to push Eisenhower forward. Now, as you think about this, remember that he spent 16 years as a major, but now what we would know is the Second World War is ramping up in a huge way. And so it comes down to this. I just want to walk you through a series of promotions of Dwight Eisenhower over a period of years. So he's working for, uh, for George Marshall as deputy chief for the War Plans Division. And uh, he becomes, first of all, in 1936, a lieutenant colonel. In 1941, temporary rank as brigadier general. And then he became a major general, again, temporary in March of 1942. In July of the same year, that's July of 1942, he's promoted to um, a four-star general. And, and so in a period of a very short amount of years, he goes from being a major to a four-star general. And then in August of 1943, He's promoted to brigadier general as a permanent rank. And so here you have the difference between the temporary rank and the permanent rank. And his permanent rank is now catching up with his temporary rank and in the most extraordinary way. In 1943, uh, he will be appointed the Supreme Allied Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. And of course, everyone knows that uh, eventually this will mean the Allied invasion of Nazi-dominated Europe. It's not known exactly that point how it would take place. By the way, Eisenhower was key in uh, helping to make the case for a Europe-first strategy. That is, even as the war would shape up after Pearl Harbor, uh, with the threat of Imperial Japan, as well as Nazi Germany, uh, Eisenhower agreed with Churchill and with others and helped to persuade the American president and others that uh, the first effort must be the defeat of Nazi Germany. Then the Allies would turn all of their attention uh, to the Pacific. But at this point, in August of 1943, Ike is just, in terms of permanent rank, a brigadier general. But in 1943, becomes Supreme Allied Commander. In the next year, he is made General of the Army. That's uh, five stars as his permanent rank. It was made permanent, actually, in 1946. So he's a five-star general. But how, how did he get from one star to five star? Well, part of it took place in one day. In August of 1943, even as he was promoted that day to the permanent rank of brigadier general, later that same day, he was given permanent rank as major general. That's how fast things happened. He, he actually advanced in rank from a brigadier general to a major general in the course of 24 hours. And that says something about Ike. It says something about the times. It says something about George Marshall understanding the key role that Dwight Eisenhower will play. But again, you just look at it and you think, how could someone see this boy from Abilene, Kansas, who ended up at West Point because he was too old for the Naval Academy and was serving in the lowest point of the American Army for so many decades and was for 16 years a major? How is he now a five-star general? And you have to say it, a lot of it had to do with Ike. A lot of it had to do with the generals. I could serve, who believed in him. A lot of it had to do with the historical moment and the great need for someone like Dwight Eisenhower. Now, of course, as he served as Supreme Allied Commander, 
he undertook, uh, under his leadership, so many different operations. The most famous of the early operations was Operation Torch in North Africa. And uh, by most estimation, Eisenhower had a, uh, a stable hand, but did not demonstrate stellar leadership. Now remember, he has a great disadvantage uh, when compared to other generals of his day. And that's because, remember, that after he graduated from West Point, he didn't get sent to Europe with the AEF in World War I. And thus he lacked combat experience and certainly combat command in World War I. And uh, just in terms of the, uh, the worldview of the army and many of his peers, that meant that he was not qualified as someone else might be for this role. But both Roosevelt and Marshall saw him as absolutely key. And uh, of course, after uh, Operation Torch, various operations, including the American invasion of Sicily, eventually Italy, but it was the invasion of France that was the big issue, the largest military operation, Operation Overlord, ever undertaken in human history. And uh, that remains so today. And it will almost assuredly always be the most massive military operation in world history because warfare has changed so much with the development of intercontinental missiles and, and uh, jet aircraft and other high technology means that it is unlikely that there will ever be the meeting of, uh, of armies, massive armies, as uh, happened in the, the last years of World War II. Now, Eisenhower during that period had to be a politician as well as a general, and this is what's really key. He had to work with Charles de Gaulle, uh, the very definition of prickly, uh, whom he also understood, as did Churchill and Roosevelt, as essential. He had to work with Churchill himself. And uh, the problem with working with Churchill is that Churchill was almost always the dominating presence in any room. But at that point, we have to recognize America is clearly leading the effort. There's no question that it would be an, an American general who would be supreme commander. And so the British in general, uh, and, and Churchill in particular, had to be satisfied with an American leader who would not lord it over the British. And Eisenhower fulfilled that role spectacularly and uh, is, is so well remembered. Bernard Law Montgomery, who was uh, himself, uh, like MacArthur, someone who saw himself as uh, the, the greatest military leader in whatever room in which he was situated, uh, he often chafed under Eisenhower, both in Eisenhower's decisions and the fact that Eisenhower, this American, was supreme commander. But later, Monty, as he was known to his own troops, said that he had never actually been able to resent Eisenhower because of Eisenhower's personality. And uh, he spoke of Eisenhower's disarming smile. And he said when Eisenhower smiles, and he knew how to deploy that smile, and uh, a gentle touch with a firm hand, uh, American leadership was sustained, uh, and the British and other allies were well mobilized and well led under that American leadership. And another American general might have failed in this task, and, and, and that's key. And uh, it's often said that Eisenhower got this role because Marshall declined it. That's technically true, but not very helpful. Because actually Roosevelt as president came to the conclusion that he could not do without Marshall as chief of staff in Washington. And uh, for personal as well as political reasons. And yet Marshall's stature meant that he could not fail to offer Marshall the, uh, the leadership of the American and allied effort in Europe, and especially what would become Operation Overlord. And so being himself a tactician of master class, Roosevelt went to Marshall uh, with the question as to whether or not he would choose to stay as chief of staff or to serve as the supreme commander in Europe. Marshall desperately wanted to lead the European effort, but he understood President Roosevelt and he understood Roosevelt's need. And it was actually a, a self-sacrificial decision that he made, but he also knew that Roosevelt had really made the decision that when Roosevelt asked him the question, he had loaded it with the answer that Marshall had to give. That instead Eisenhower would lead uh, the effort in Europe and Marshall would stay at home. And history honors George Marshall for uh, that incredible role he played. And of course, later he stayed very active in history as Secretary of State and uh, the author of what became known as the Marshall Plan for the Rescue of Europe. But back to Eisenhower, uh, in the course of the war, the, this greatest challenge uh, 
was tactical and strategic and political, and that was figuring out how in the world to construct this massive invasion that would be successful. And it had to be successful in levels that most Americans now don't think about. The invasion was one thing. It had to be successful in the beginning. But Eisenhower understood that the greatest difficulty would be in the immediate weeks after the invasion. And, and that's where he, his organizational skills came to the fore. If you have an army that even successfully, or an, an invasion of armies that is successful in creating a beachhead there in France, in Normandy, holding it is going to be just as difficult as establishing it. And uh, again, a general without the organizational skills of Eisenhower uh, might well not have come up with a plan that was eventually as successful as was Operation Overlord. Eisenhower's leadership in the military was never uh, unquestioned in terms of uh, decisions that he made. Uh, in the legacy of World War II, uh, the, the greatest blame that is assessed to Eisenhower is the failure to recognize the Nazi threat that would become very clear coming out of the Ardennes uh, in what became known as the Battle of the Bulge. But nonetheless, uh, Eisenhower was, uh, as a Supreme Commander, able to rally the Allied forces rather quickly uh, to hasten the defeat of Nazi Germany. And it was extremely political. You had the Russians coming from the, the Soviets, we should say, coming from the East and the, the uh, Americans and the, and, and the British along with some others, but primarily the Americans and the British, uh, along with some of the French moving from the West. The question is, of course, who will cross the Rhine, who will take Berlin. Very political. Those decisions not all made by Eisenhower, but never made without him. After the war, and uh, there, there's so much that goes on to this, you have Eisenhower who on, has to make a decision, and, uh, and it came down to weather. And, and those of you who know the history of World War II and, and D-Day, you know that Eisenhower had to make a horrifying decision based upon what we would now consider to be insanely rudimentary uh, weather data and forecasting. He decided to go forward, and that turned out to be providentially exactly the right thing to do. But he knew it was at stake and actually had written a letter uh, taking full responsibility for a failed invasion. He carried it in his pocket. Uh, by the way, later in life, of course, uh, he became known as an avid golfer as president. And uh, people would ask him about the weather, and he said, I never care about the weather. The last time I cared about the weather was D-Day, and after that, I will never care about the weather again. Uh, after the successful war uh, of the Allies, uh, of course, Eisenhower stays in Europe for a period of time uh, as the military general of the liberated Europe, and uh, there again, it was a political role with military ramifications. But things then moved rather quickly. What would Eisenhower do after the war? That service as the military general was temporary, and Eisenhower was restless. He came back to the United States and eventually took the role as the president of Columbia University. That's a part of Eisenhower's biography a lot of people forget. But he, he spent this couple of years, 1948 to 1950, as the president of an Ivy League university. And uh, th th this was a rocky role for Eisenhower. Not that he was unaccustomed to leadership. He was just unaccustomed to academic leadership and to working with academics. Now, I just have to insert here, evidently, working with academics is a, a challenge that uh, even daunted Dwight Eisenhower, which is to say, you're working with people who don't see themselves as part of an army at a university like Columbia. And uh, at Columbia, you had so many people who had PhD degrees. Eisenhower, of course, did not have one. All he had done was win the war and save democracy and liberty. Uh, but it was, a, it was a mismatched role in many ways. Uh, Eisenhower's brother Milton, by the way, would serve as president of several major American universities. And, is a, is, and at one point, by the way, was better known uh, in the United States than was his brother, who, remember, was a major for 16 years. But nonetheless, he didn't stay at Columbia for long, and this is key. In 1950, he was named Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now, that's key, coming out of the, the ruins of, uh, of World War II and the Allied determination uh, to create a unified military command that would not stare down Nazi Germany, but would be ready to stare down Soviet Russia. And uh, once again, the, this is a political as well as a military role. No one is conceivable in that role except Dwight David Eisenhower. And so he, with his five-star rank, 
he goes to be the commanding general of uh, Allied forces in NATO. That's 1950. But then things are changing again. At the end of World War I, you'll remember that Woodrow Wilson had his peace plan and wanted to create the League of Nations. You'll remember the United States never entered the League of Nations. It was a failed project. Uh, America's commitment to internationalism was extremely controversial at the end of World War I. It was less controversial at the end of World War II. It's more controversial now. I mean, whether you take a Britain with Brexit or you take uh, President Trump's approach to many American treaties and, and even to NATO itself, uh, these things are controversial anew, because, uh, largely because historically the Soviet Union is not the threat that it once was. But when you go to the end of World War II, I, I said that's a bit different. Americans were now more committed to an internationalist understanding because America is now the great power on the world scene. And, and once you've had millions and millions of American troops and forces in the, both the Pacific theater and in the European theater, you, you, you have an American changed vision of the world. And uh, America doesn't want to be the world's policeman, but it's unavoidable that America will have to make major decisions and often exercise decisive leadership. So NATO became a part of that. But there was an isolationist strain, and that isolationist strain in the Republican Party threatened to dominate. And that isolationist strain in the Republican Party was associated mostly with Senator Robert A. Taft, the son of the president, William Howard Taft. And Taft was Mr. Republican. And uh, he had sought the Republican presidential nomination repeatedly, and it was almost assured that Taft would gain the nomination in 1952. Taft was not a supporter of NATO. Taft was described as something of an isolationist. Now, Eisenhower is not an isolationist. Given his biography, he couldn't be. Two things came to Eisenhower's mind. Number one, America is about to become a one-party country. Uh, Democrats had been electing presidents. You think, just think of Roosevelt for four terms, and then Harry Truman uh, elected uh, on his own in 1948. And uh, he was certain that Robert Taft would be defeated. And, and that would just mean an unbroken line of Democratic supremacy, not only with majorities in Congress uh, throughout many of those years, but uh, dominating in the White House. Eisenhower, the general who had had to serve in so many political roles, understood that would not be healthy for the country. But he also was very much concerned about a lack of support for NATO. And he saw the emergence of Robert Taft and his isolationist uh, philosophy as dangerous to the world, not only to the Republican Party. And many people came to the conclusion that there was only one person who could run for the Republican presidential nomination and defeat Taft and thus defeat the isolationist strain uh, in America. Now, Taft, I want to say, here's a footnote. I want to defend Robert Taft a bit here. He was more than just what would be described as an isolationist. He was also a classical conservative. And in many ways, American political conservatism today looks back to Robert Taft uh, as, a, as a pole star of sorts uh, in, in terms not only of his international understandings, but of his understandings of American domestic policy and, and political philosophy. So much so that when Eisenhower decides to run for the Republican nomination in 52 and defeats Taft, well, Eisenhower is hated by many of those in the American conservative ranks, including people like William F. Buckley Jr. And I say hated, that's a strong word, but it was felt by Buckley and others that Eisenhower had stopped in 1952 the conservative ascendancy in the Republican Party. Now, again, why do I say that? Because some of the strains you know today in the Republican Party are those strains. They are still there. But Eisenhower was elected president in 1952. How? I mean, and as what? Here's the amazing thing. No one knew that he was a Republican. And as a matter of fact, uh, both the Democrats and the Republicans were interested in Eisenhower running for president. Uh, both parties had some interest in Eisenhower running for president in 1948. Uh, now, of course, Truman's the incumbent president. He becomes the nominee. But he's afraid that Eisenhower's going to run as a Republican against him. Eisenhower assures him, I'm not going to do that. But he does run as the Republican nominee in 1952. He sees it as a way to establish uh, NATO and internationalism as a, a part of America's fighting philosophy. And uh, he wants to rescue, as he sees it, the two-party system. 
But Eisenhower never becomes Mr. Republican in a way that Taft had been Mr. Republican, or, or others, including his vice president, Richard Nixon, would be Mr. Republican. And it's contestable whether Eisenhower was really much of a conservative. And it's very difficult, actually, to come up with a governing philosophy of uh, Dwight Eisenhower. But let me just remind you, he was elected president twice, 1952. He defeated Adlai Stevenson, very liberal intellectual figure, by the way, who had the the Illinois governor who had the Democratic nomination. He had an electoral college win that was massive, 442 to 89. And uh, he ran against uh, Stevenson again in 1956 and actually bested what he'd done in 1952, winning an electoral college victory of 457 to 73. Eisenhower is president. Just, uh, just think with me for a moment. The 38th president of the United States is uh, noteworthy, I think, historically for 13 reasons. I'm just going to mention them. Number one, the emergence of the United States as the dominant world power of the West. It took Eisenhower's experience as supreme commander, as the commander of NATO, to, to understand how to describe to the American people in this great period of that strategic decade, especially the 50s, what America's role must be as the dominant world power. Secondly, he helped to define the Cold War against the Soviet Union. He did so in tandem with his famous Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles. And uh, together, they basically applied what would become known as containment, the effort to contain the uh, spread and expansion of, uh, of Soviet communism around the world, indeed, global communism around the world. The third issue is the nuclear age. Uh, Eisenhower didn't know what to think of nuclear weapons. No one did when all of a sudden they, they came and... 1945, at the end of World War II, and really brought about the sudden uh, conclusive end uh, to the war against Imperial Japan. But uh, the great debate as to whether nuclear weapons are a part of normal warfare or not. Interestingly, Eisenhower seemed in the beginning to think that nuclear weapons might be a part of normal warfare. But as president, he came increasingly to the conclusion that the result would be annihilation. And uh, so you see that the, the turn also in American and, frankly, at, to some extent, Soviet understandings of the cost of a, a nuclear exchange. Fourth, NATO, American commitment to NATO and, uh, and, and ultimate leadership in NATO, uh, very key. Eisenhower also believed that the Allies should contribute more uh, to the defense of Western Europe than they did or than they have. You see those strains also very much right now. In the United States, a period fifth of economic prosperity, the baby boom is exploding. You have the rising middle class. And uh, Eisenhower is remembered in the 50s for a booming economy. And in general, it was. And uh, it was America, again, uh, moving into economic greatness, unleashing the energies that came out of the uh, the winning of World War II more than anything else and America's role in the, in the world. Uh, six, the interstate highway system. Uh, you know, we, we drive on those highways all the time. Eisenhower really had that idea, very frustrated. And if he had been born on the East Coast or the West Coast, he might never have come up with the interstate highway system, but he was born in, uh, in Texas and of course raised in Abilene, Kansas. And it took a long time by car to get anywhere, to car or truck, anywhere in the United States. It was extremely uneconomical. You had all these local jurisdictions. You had roads that were uh, of uh, varying quality and repair. It was one problem after another. It could take weeks to drive much distance in the United States. Eisenhower had seen the Autobahns in Germany and uh, understood that given the massive size and the transcontinental uh, immense of the United States, the interstate highway system would be key, uh, first of all, to unleashing the economic energies of the country. And it, and it is. It, it has been. It's more than that. It was also built with uh, at least some military significance in mind. But uh, it's now called, officially, the Eisenhower Interstate System. Uh, seventh, the National Security Council. It existed before, but Eisenhower, having served in such high posts of military service, understood that the National Security Council in the White House was going to be key to the day-to-day -day security of the United States. And uh, so he, again, given his organizational ability, organized the National Security Council. And uh, by the way, that was weakened by his successor, John F. Kennedy, and uh, is largely uh, blamed for some of the failures, especially the Bay of Pigs, uh, and uh, even uh, some of the the great risk in the Cuban Missile Crisis because the NSC had been neglected. And uh, it shows you the difference, if you're going to explain it in military terms, between someone who served 
uh, as a rather junior officer and someone who served as Supreme Commander. You have a different view of, uh, of the importance of something like the National Security Council. In court appointments, of course, serving two terms, President Eisenhower appointed all kinds of federal judges, but he appointed five justices of the Supreme Court, including Earl Warren, who had been uh, appointed by Eisenhower in 1953. And uh, Warren, a fascinating figure himself, at one point was both the Democratic and the Republican nominee, serving as governor of California. And it was uh, as governor of California, he was tapped uh, by Eisenhower to be chief justice. Uh, Eisenhower later regretted that he had done so, but uh, nonetheless, it was a decisive appointment. It also points to the fact that Republicans during this time are, are basically not giving that much attention to judicial philosophy. Again, fast forward to 2020, you understand uh, how electing a Republican presidents for many years did not lead to uh, any kind of correction on the Supreme Court. It took intentionality that came only in the last few decades uh, by Republican presidents. Um, civil rights, Eisenhower, of course, was uh, president as the Brown versus Board of Education decision was handed down. Uh, he sought a gradualist approach in, uh, in applying it across the country. But when there was absolute defiance, as in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, he sent in the 101st Airborne Division in order to enforce the court's decree for the desegregation of schools there. Again, uh, massively controversial decision constitutionally, but made a very clear point. Uh, Ike was still a commanding general in this sense. Uh, he has to be remembered 10th for the heart attack that he suffered in 1955. Uh, the White House basically hid from America how uh, damaged Eisenhower's heart was. Uh, and of course, he would run for president for a second term in 1956. Americans would never, I think it's fair to say, have elected Ike to a second term if they had had any idea of how devastating his heart attack was and how medically mismanaged uh, it was. But nonetheless, uh, Ike did survive. But uh, Richard Nixon basically operated in many ways as, uh, as president, uh, standing in uh, when uh, President Eisenhower was debilitated and unable. Um, Eisenhower never uh, adequately appreciated Nixon for that and because Nixon was always deferential, never tried to put himself forward. But uh, Eisenhower never had a great relationship with Nixon. Vietnam, uh, Eisenhower is actually the progenitor. Uh, he's actually the one who came up with the words, the domino theory, he, or at least he explained it as a set of dominoes, that if, Japan, if uh, Vietnam fell, communist aggression, then all of Southeast Asia would fall. The domino theory did not stand well over time, uh, but it was apparent uh, that it looked that way during the Eisenhower years. The French were failing in Vietnam. Eisenhower did not want to uh, inject massive American forces into Vietnam, but he didn't want Vietnam to fall. Of course, by the time his successor escalates, uh, eventually Vietnam becomes an enormous quagmire and one of the most controversial actions in American history. But Eisenhower was the one who underlined the strategic nature of Vietnam. It could not be allowed to fall, lest all of Southeast Asia would fall. In 1960, uh, in the end of the Eisenhower administration, the greatest uh, problem emerged for Eisenhower when a, an American U-2 spy plane was shot down over Soviet territory. And uh, the CIA informed Eisenhower that the plane had been shot down, but also told him that there was absolutely no chance that the pilot had survived and uh, thus could be uh, identified or much less interrogated by the Soviets. But as we now know, Nikita Khrushchev held a press conference and produced Francis Gary Powers, who was the American pilot. This led to not only a, a humiliation for the United States, uh, but also the one moment in Eisenhower's legacy in which uh, he had allowed what can only be described as a, an untruth uh, to be communicated to the American people and internationally, something he regretted uh, thereafter tremendously. And you can understand in the moment how it was the tensions of the Cold War. It's almost impossible for us to rewind and understand that. But uh, it, that was the point at which Eisenhower also came to the conclusion that he couldn't trust the analysis of the CIA. His farewell address uh, after his vice president, Richard Nixon, has been narrowly defeated by John F. Kennedy. His farewell address uh, to the nation 
as he was leaving office, he warned about what he called a military-industrial complex. And, and, and this was something that Eisenhower saw. It's often cited by politicians today, but the point is that Eisenhower saw uh, a, a symmetry, a synthesis, a, a, a synergy between uh, the uh, military and industry in such a way that uh, he saw it threatening American democracy. And uh, this was in the midst of the Cold War. The, the fact is, just to be honest, no American president has known what to do with that since Ike said it. And uh, there still is a military industrial complex and there, there's almost no way around it. But that was uh, Eisenhower's prophetic word, lest the military swallow its nation. Okay, Eisenhower is incredibly popular, often reaching 70% popularity, uh, 80% at one point after the Geneva summit with the Soviets in 1955. Those are spectacular numbers. American presidents don't get near those numbers, certainly for any period of time. But Eisenhower befuddled his friends and his enemies. How, how was he doing this? Uh, why was he so popular? And, and then, even as he left office, people asked the question, what exactly did he do? Uh, was he a do-nothing president? Was he a do-little president? Was he basically a president who played golf and, and let staff run the country? No one appeared really to be ready to answer that question. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. in about 1960, rating the presidents, and of course he was very close to JFK, but m it's just important here, he ranked Ike 28th out of 33, and that was pretty much an historical consensus. Uh, let's just say that's the bottom of the barrel, 28 out of 33 presidents at the time. People, when Eisenhower left office, said he wasn't that great a president. Great general, mediocre president, not sure what he did, but recently, he has been rather consistently ranked in the top 10 American presidents out of 45 and uh, has often been ranked as high as five. What happened? Well, here's what happened. Over a period of history after Eisenhower left office, he started looking better and better. Just think of this. Eisenhower was the only successful president in electoral and political terms until Ronald Reagan, who was elected in 1980. Now, that's a long period of time. But every president between Eisenhower and Reagan ended in scandal or political defeat uh, or uh, what was considered to be uh, an ineffectual legacy. And, uh, and oftentimes, all you have to think about is Watergate, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, uh, the collapse of the Great Society in uh, the end of the Johnson administration, and, and you, you just fast forward, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, until Ronald Reagan, and, and by the way, we understand that only in history too, uh, people didn't know where Eisenhower really fit. But in 1982, Fred Greenstein Stein wrote a book entitled The Hidden Hand Presidency. It's very interesting. Greenstein argued, okay, here's the deal. It turns out that Ike was really running everything. Now, we didn't know it, said uh, Greenstein at the time. We didn't know it. That's why it was the Hidden Hand Presidency, but it turns out he was he was really running things. He was, he was doing a whole lot more than we thought. He was really in command of the uh, American government and of his administration. Well, the historians debated that. But then as time goes on, more archival material becomes open, more files become declassified. And as it turns out, and historians are now pretty much agreed, Eisenhower was not a hands-off president, he was hands-on. But as politically skillful as he was in World War II, in uh, in getting things done without becoming the main character on the stage in a drama, turned out that's how he had played the presidency as well. And so Eisenhower's remembered now. And so I go back to those two questions. How did he come to dominate an age? 16-year major becomes five-star general. Uh, but then how did he now come to be seen as dominating an age when no one seemed to recognize that he was doing so at the time? Well, it comes down to leadership and the fact that the times and the leader have to hit at some point in common, and, uh, and then everything is made different. Well, just very quickly, a few points about uh, Eisenhower. What we learned from him, first, organization. He, he, we see this Eisenhower the general and Eisenhower the president. A leader who can't organize is a leader who's not, in the end, a leader. There's no effectiveness without organization. There's more to leadership than organization, but there's never less to it. Infrastructure. He believed in infrastructure. You, you, uh, institutions, organizations, nations, armies need stuff. And they need ways of obtaining and maintaining stuff. They need the right stuff. They need to know what the right stuff is. Infrastructure is important. And that was really key to the growth of America and of the American government uh, during the period of the Eisenhower years.
Third, personal warmth. And again, he had emotional intelligence. That's a term that has only emerged in the last several decades. But like, again, Ronald Reagan, another successful two-term Republican president, he exuded personal warmth. Now, like Reagan, he was not so warm in person. Uh, people who worked with Reagan will say he had the amazing ability to be warm in, uh, in, in a large context, but not so warm in a, in a tighter context. Eisenhower was that way. It was like... Like other leaders, he could kind of turn on a switch. And it was natural growing up as he, as he did in a family of seven boys. Uh, fourth, a basic optimism about life. And, um, you know, optimism can be false or it can be genuine, but Eisenhower had every reason uh, to believe that uh, America would prevail, that righteousness and truth would prevail. And that gave him a basic optimism in life. He told the truth. Again, a basic commitment with the exception of that U-2 incident. Um, and uh, telling the truth is extremely important for leaders. And when it doesn't happen, disaster ensues. Patience. The, the patience of waiting in the United States Army when it didn't appear that there would be any real future for him. That patience was richly rewarded. Loyalty up the ladder, seven. Uh, Eisenhower was a very good staff officer. So, so good, he was almost surely the most outstanding staff officer of the American Army in his era. And there'd be many who had been dissatisfied with that, but actually serving as staff officer is what prepared him to become the supreme commander. Eighth, he described his own leadership as the middle way. And uh, th this is an interesting thing politically. And again, he wasn't even known to be a Republican until he became a Republican candidate for president. Um, I wasn't known for a clear political philosophy. That middle way, I would argue, was only made possible because there was a huge political consensus during the 1950s. You couldn't tell a lot of difference between the Republican and the Democratic parties on, on policies or on issues. And certainly the great moral issues of our day had not emerged. So I could afford a middle way in a way that I don't believe any president really thereafter could afford. So this is one part of Eisenhower's legacy. Uh, he could be a moderate, but uh, very few moderates uh, could, uh, could emerge in leadership after him. Uh, America has changed, and in many ways, we're, we're looking at two different visions of the nation. Active leadership, again, not just a hidden hand, but a very active hand. Um, one of the things I think about with Eisenhower, just very quickly, is that he was able to exercise virtues at the right time. And so one of the things about Eisenhower is he demonstrated tremendous courage, but no one knew he had it. You didn't have to have tremendous courage when you're writing the history of the military monuments in Europe. It's, it's courage when courage was needed, the virtues that show up just at the right time. He was secure in his own self-knowledge, long experience studying leaders. He had a sense of history and his place in it and a commitment to America as a nation. He was convinced of American greatness. He, uh, he wasn't too concerned with whether history would record Eisenhower greatness. And there's greatness in that. He saw the greatness in his country. Gene Edward Smith, uh, one of the defining biographers of Eisenhower, put it this way, quote, Dwight Eisenhower remains an enigma. For the majority of Americans, he is a benign fatherly figure looking indistinctly out of the mists of the past, a high-ranking general who directed the Allied armies to victory in Europe, and a caretaker president who presided over eight years of international peace and domestic tranquility. To those who knew him, Ike was a tireless taskmaster, who worked with incredible subtlety to move events in the direction he wished them to go. Most would agree he was a man of principle, decency, and common sense, whom the country would, could count on to do what is right. In both war and peace, he gave the world confidence in American leadership. Uh, that's why I wanted to talk about Dwight Eisenhower today. Always a general, Dwight David Eisenhower, in war and in peace. And uh, I look forward to a discussion about Eisenhower and his leadership. And for that, we'll be right back. Well, thanks for joining with us today. Uh, in order to participate with sending a question or a comment, just text to 502-209-8017. That's again, 502-209-8017. Uh, we have a couple of things already been sent. Andy from Georgia asking, what were the toughest wartime and peacetime decisions Eisenhower had to make? I, I think when it comes to wartime, the big issue has to be, one, uh, the timing and the dimensions and the location of the D-Day invasion. Uh, and in the end, the timing was the most excruciating question. It comes down to the matter of weather. But uh, I also want to say as a leader, uh, 
Some of the hardest decisions in World War II that Eisenhower had to make were about command uh, and, and like repeated questions of what to do. He had to sack generals. Uh, he had to evaluate generals. He had to promote uh, generals. And uh, he had to deal with people like George S. Patton. And uh, so as it turned out, Ike was a tremendous judge of command leadership. And, uh, and, and that meant in the American army, but also in the larger allied effort. He, uh, he figured out how to deploy commanders. And, uh, and, and he, stuck with, he stuck with commanders even after they had experienced setbacks or failures, but not when he thought they were spent in terms of their credibility. And uh, at that point, he took decisive action. But th those were very hard decisions and, and also political. Colonel Tim Moore, some observers have lamented the recent decline in leadership within the military, especially as ranking generals have embraced the slide towards secular progressivism uh, infecting our greater culture. Do you see warning signs in our current moment in history? Yes, uh, Colonel Moore, I do. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, a part of it is that uh, the, uh, the leadership education, the academic structure of our military academies uh, is a part of that larger academic uh, context, which has been almost overwhelmingly taken over by the academic left. And, uh, and so uh, that's a huge problem. And uh, generals, and you know, I know some who've told me straight out, uh, they are put in context now in which many, and it's not just generals, but it's officers in the American military are evaluated according to standards that uh, on uh, inclusivity and, and tolerance and other things are basically being written by uh, the, uh, the same folks who are uh, writing the rules for corporations and universities on LGBTQ issues and many things. And, and there, there's this basic divide. And uh, so it goes back, you know, Tim, I go back to, to the Eisenhower years as president in the 1950s. There was a common moral judgment on the part of Americans about almost every major moral issue. And, uh, and, uh, and, and by the way, that included civil rights in the sense that the American people overwhelmingly believed that, uh, that segregation was wrong and, and should be remedied. The question was, by what means and how fast? Uh, but that, uh, the, that, that entire moral cohesiveness is broken apart with the sexual and moral revolutions that have taken place. And, and behind that is the secularization of the culture. So I, I, I share that concern. I'm thankful for so many wonderful, committed Americans and American Christians who are serving in the military and are serving in the leadership ranks, the officer ranks of the military. Uh, we, we need to pray for them and uh, be thankful for them. Uh, John from Georgia made mention of Fox Connor teaching Eisenhower how to read military history as I read military history. How do I do it? What am I looking for? Uh, do I annot annotate while reading? Yeah, so John, great question. Uh, military history is just about my most favorite avocational reading, uh, along with fiction. They're, they're very different, but I have to read, uh, kind of for my own sanity, a good bit of both. And, and it's historical biography, which, uh, so it's not just military, but historical biography. And uh, yes, I annotate. Uh, I, I have some rare books that I would never touch with a pen. They stay pristine and preserved. But the books I use in my working library, which is the vast majority, uh, they got marks all over them. I use a red flare pen in my hand. I'm making notes all over the place. I have a, an ink pen very close by. I have my own system of uh, symbols. I'm going to do a, a, a video, a lecture on uh, just the kind of just system I've developed for myself in hopes it might be helpful to others. But, uh, and then I keep those books um, with all my notes. I, I, in other words, I keep the notes in the book. So I, I write on the page. So I don't have to go find my notes about that book. It's right in the book. I can pull it out. Thinking about Eisenhower, I was able to go and pull just all kinds of volumes off the shelf in my library. And all the notes I had about Eisenhower were there, including... Uh, notes that I took about Fox Connor teaching him how to read uh, and to read military history. And so, yep, that's a great question, John. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Scott from Cashton, Wisconsin, you mentioned Ike's faith as a child. What role influence did his faith play in his leadership, both as general and president? You know, Ike described himself as the most religious man he knew, uh, which doesn't ring really true. Uh, it tells you something about how Ike saw himself, but uh, that, that doesn't ring particularly true uh, during the time that he was uh, either general or president. Um, and, and there's a part of Ike's uh, family's uh, historical biography that uh, isn't often mentioned, and, and that's the fact that uh, Eisenhower's mother, th this is fascinating, by the way, 
uh, as River Brethren, uh, they were pacifists. And so, and by the way, Ike's mother, Ida, never reconciled herself to the fact that her son was Supreme Commander of Allied Forces fighting Nazi Germany. She was still a pacifist. Something that, by the way, was not advertised to the American Army because no one exactly knew what to do with the Supreme Commander whose mother was a pacifist. Uh, but nonetheless, his mother became a Jehovah's Witness. Now, you'll see that in almost none of the records. Ike doesn't mention it. Uh, Ike's granddaughter, Susan Eisenhower, in writing about her grandfather, doesn't mention it. Mentions the River Brethren, doesn't mention the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses had meetings in the Eisenhower house when Eisenhower was a boy, but Eisenhower never became a Jehovah's Witness. In fact, through most of his life, he was not considered anything. Uh, now, here's the twist and turn to that story. On the other hand, Dwight David Eisenhower is the only president of the United States to receive Christian baptism as president. Now, I'm a Baptist, so I'm going to have to say he received what he and his Presbyterian church called baptism. Uh, wasn't enough water for a Baptist, but nonetheless, uh, it was a decisive act. No other president of the United States has, has been baptized in that sense uh, in office. Now, why was Eisenhower baptized in 1952? Well, let me give you two readings. So there's a secular reading of Eisenhower and there is a, uh, a, a more Christian reading of Eisenhower. Here, here's the secular reading. Eisenhower believed that as a part of American identity in the Cold War, Americans needed a religious identity, and for Americans that would be a Christian identity, and he needed a way to express his Christian identity. He resisted joining a church, but he said, he said, and this sounds rather cynical, he said, but joining a specific church would be easier to answer than saying I'm a Christian but not a member of any church. Instead, he said, it's going to be easier to say I'm a Presbyterian. Okay? You understand that. Now, there's more to that story, because Eisenhower is actually a part of America's theological history. And this is true whether you take the secular reading or the more Christian reading. In the secular reading, Eisenhower believed that one of the distinctions between secular godless communism and American democracy was the Christian faith and commitment behind America. And so he said, and, and this is uh, uh, from a speech he gave in 1952. So uh, this is December, this is a month before his inauguration, Eisenhower says this, quote, and this is how they, meaning the, the founding fathers, explained those rights. Quote, we hold that all men are endowed by their creator. Eisenhower went on, not by accident of their birth, not by the color of their skins or by anything else, but all men are endowed by their creator. In other words, said Eisenhower, our form of government has no sense unless it is founded in a deeply felt religious faith, and I don't care what it is. With us, of course, it's the Judeo-Christian concept, but it must be a religion with all men in which all men are created equal, end quote. Now, Eisenhower has now gone down in American theological history as the guy who said every nation needs to have a great religious faith and I don't care what it is. Now, there are different readings of that. Uh, one of them is that in the main, uh, he was speaking like of denominations. Uh, but the context seems that to say that even as he looks at the world, uh, and it could be Buddhism in some country, there has, to be a, there has to be a theological center. Now, this is why American theologians say, well, if you look back to the 1950s, what you see there is the emergence of civil religion. It's not genuine Christianity. It's an official state-dependent religious faith that just given our history happens to be Christianity here. Now, as a, an evangelical theologian, I want to tell you, there really is something to this argument about civil religion. Uh, a lot of Americans say they're Christians because they're Americans, and uh, there's no real gospel, biblical Christianity there at all. So that's a, that, that's a key issue. And Eisenhower is here kind of blamed as the godfather of civil religion. Now, this, the, again, the cynical secular reading is Eisenhower had no real religious faith, but he believed the American people needed some kind of religious faith. And so he was baptized, became a Presbyterian, because he was this advocate of civil religion. <clears throat> uh, so that, that's the secular reading. But there's a different reading, and uh, I'd recommend a book to you to, uh, to see this other reading. It's by Alan Sears, who's a, a good friend of mine, Craig Austin and Ryan Cole. The title is The Soul of an American President. And, uh, and they make a very convincing case for the fact that Eisenhower did become uh, a believing Christian and uh, remained actively engaged as a believing Christian with the church until the very point of his death. And uh, just for the sake of time, I can't recapitulate the whole argument, but they pull out uh, 
a great deal of material. So, and, and they openly uh, confront that secular reading of Eisenhower. And, and here's, here's one of the problems, and I'm gonna have to end uh, uh, answering this question. I could talk about this for a long time. Uh, it's, it energizes me. But he, he, here, here's, here's one of the last things to think about. In the 20th century, looking at a figure like Eisenhower, you have to recognize on both sides of the Atlantic in the English-speaking world, there was a reticence for leaders to talk about their personal religious convictions because it appeared unseemly. So whether you're talking about Churchill or Roosevelt, or you can just go down the list, uh, there wasn't much conversation. You really don't have uh, the kind of conversations that, uh, that now in the United States we, we expect. And, and so I'll, I'll just tell you that in 19, when the 1980 Republican nomination race was, uh, was heating up, a group of conservative Christian pastors met with the various Republican candidates. Uh, D. James Kennedy, then pastor of the Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church of Fort Lauderdale and the, the father of evangelism explosion, was one of those pastors. And uh, he would ask every one of those contenders for the Republican nomination, uh, if you were to die today and you were to stand before God, uh, and uh, he was to say, why should I let you into heaven? How would you answer him? And are you sure today if you would die? If you know EE, you know I've reversed those questions and paraphrased them, but if you were to die today, are you certain you'd go to heaven? A lot of the candidates absolutely fumbled it. Uh, Ronald Reagan was ready with an answer, and uh, that's a part of how that cemented bond came about. But the thing is, here's the thing. Until D. James Kennedy asked those questions in 1980, no one had dared ask presidential questions, uh, presidential candidates those questions. And so uh, we know much more because people are now asking the questions in a way they did not in the past. Randy from Simi Valley, General Schwarzkopf, famously placed competence and character high on the list uh, of leadership requirements. Eisenhower took command of the Allied Theater with no combat experience. Where would Eisenhower place competence on the leadership resume? Well, you know, here's the interesting thing. And, and Eisenhower understood this. He was frustrated by it. Again, he wanted combat experience in World War I, but he, he, he didn't have that opportunity. Uh, but he knew those who did. And so, you know, at the, at the top of the Allied Operational Command, uh, Eisenhower knew how to put the people with the greatest competence for the greatest need where they needed to be. And that's a competence. And, and so it's, uh, it, it's a matter of deploying the people who had the right combat experience. Uh, and, and look, this is an ongoing problem in the American military. And uh, it's the problem of long periods of peace. And I mean that in terms of the absence of a major war. Uh, if, as you look from you know, 1776 and go forward, um, you, you would have leaders forged in a certain crucible of war, and then they would age out. And, uh, and, and so, you know, it, or they would have a different kind of experience. You know, the people that experience in the first Gulf War have a different kind of uh, American military experience than those who've been involved in the ongoing uh, American efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, those who were in Vietnam had a very different kind of experience than those who were in uh, the Second World War. So a part of it is that understanding of history. It, has to, it takes a far larger canvas. Colonel John Scherer, United States Air Force, thank you for writing. Uh, Monterey, California, did I read Going Home to Glory in your preparation for this lecture on General Eisenhower? Yeah, yes, I did. And, and again, there, there, there are so many good books out there on Eisenhower. Uh, I tell you what, I will put together uh, a, a list of, uh, uh, of books that I'll uh, give to our folks and they can put it up. Uh, I will, uh, I'll tell you that the, the, the book that probably sparked my interest in, in this talk today, just in terms of the timing, uh, was uh, the, uh, the book uh, Generals in the Making that uh, had a great deal to do with uh, MacArthur, Eisenhower, Patton, and others. Uh, between the wars and what was happening to them. And uh, I'll be honest, I found that absolutely fascinating. And uh, we'll put that bibliographic information up so that people can find it. By the way, the other issue of timing, which I didn't say in the address for sake of time, is that just in the last few days, the Eisenhower Memorial in Washington, D.C. has been open. And the reason I didn't give it a lot of time is because it itself is, to me, something of a fiasco. In our uh, postmodern, confused time, we're not sure what to say about a man of historical greatness like Eisenhower, I don't think the monument is, uh, is equal to the man in, in this sense. It represents a lot of confusion. And by the way, uh, 
the Eisenhower family fought it being done because uh, Frank Gehry and his group, the architect, uh, and by the way, if you've seen his designs, you can't imagine anything more unlike Eisenhower, uh, it, it became a matter of kind of white-knuckled political fight. But the memorial's open, and uh, despite the fact that I think it's uh, certainly going to be underwhelming in terms of sending the message, uh, I think a far more classicist monument would have been called for. I, I promise you I'll go see it the next time I'm in, I'm in Washington, that's for sure. I, uh, Alex from North Carolina, would Ike get elected in 2020 with his middle way approach? Alex, I think it's easy to say no. Uh, uh, I don't think the middle way would work any time other than when there's a vast national consensus. And that was true in the 50s. You had the Democrats and the Republicans. Again, I could have run as a Democrat or a Republican. No one even knew what he was. That's how close the parties were. But, and, and look, so what caused that? Well, what caused that was the great consensus that had to be forged out of the Great Depression and out of World War II more than anything else about who America was, how America had to work. Uh, we haven't had that kind of synthesizing experience over the last several decades. We've had the polarization uh, in which the two parties now are, they don't even share the same facts. Uh, you know, so the, the, the middle way doesn't exist uh, when you're looking at a debate over, say, um, uh, uh, the, the LGBTQ issues, uh, when you have the activists, you know, in, in, that, uh, in that movement who explicitly dismiss any possibility of a middle way. And uh, when, when you're down to matters of right and wrong, I mean, are, are, you, are you going to allow biological boys to use the girls' room or the locker room in the school? What's the middle way there? Uh, it, it's very, very difficult. Um, and, uh, and, and that's true in economics, taxation. Uh, you go down the list. That's one of the reasons why the Senate is an entirely different forum than it was uh, just a matter of 20 or 30 years ago. Wayne, why have we not had a general as president since Eisenhower? What happened or changed? Well, some generals have run. Uh, uh, since, uh, since Eisenhower is in office, but it's, it's a very, very difficult thing. For one thing, uh, what it takes to be a candidate for president now is, is, is very different. Now, in American history, generals, well, we had a general as our first president. Uh, fast forward to the period after the, the Civil War, almost all the presidents in a row for a long time were Union Army generals. That's just, the, that's just the way it was. That's how they'd emerged in leadership. That's how they, they had emerged in command. Uh, but when you go to the period after, say, World War I, you're really not looking at generals. Um, and, and the only general you really had as president after that period was Dwight Eisenhower. Remember, MacArthur thought he was presidential material, but he was frankly humiliated in the Republican uh, primaries in 1948. So it's really that Eisenhower is the singular distinctive as a general who has served as president. And, and look, it's because, even just think of, of, uh, of Eisenhower's command title, Supreme Commander, Allied Expeditionary Forces in the European Theater. Um, he had a prominence, I mean, just, just think of the, the necessary news coverage of World War II Eisenhower is out there all the time. Eisenhower was a fixture in the American mind uh, in a way that, uh, that it's, it's almost impossible for any general to be. And again, the leadership structure, here's another key issue. The leadership structure in America was uh, a much more conscribed, smaller elite during that period. No, oh, everyone could know everybody. And uh, out of that, people could emerge as leaders by consensus. And uh, remember that Eisenhower really didn't have to win the, the primaries to be, become the Republican nominee. The Republican grandees, as they were called, the leaders of the Republican Party basically said, we want you to be our presidential nominee. There was more to it than that, but it was all basically the Republican leadership coming to Eisenhower saying, you're the man. Uh, that's just not gonna happen again. It's not just the military that's changed, it's the entire political process and presidential elections that have changed. Uh, Dwight from Missouri, how do we reconcile Dwight David Eisenhower's moral failings and the handling of his wife's issues and difficulties when he was in the military and as president? Y you know, uh, Dwight, uh, uh, that, that was a hard issue for me to know how to address uh, 
and how directly to address because it's, uh, it's, it's just absolutely true that during the time that Ike was serving as Supreme Commander, uh, he had an entirely inappropriate relationship with an aide by the name of Kay Summersby. And uh, th there, is, there is evidence that at one point he considered leaving Mamie, his wife, whom he married in 1916, and marrying Kay. Uh, but that would have been impossible for him to maintain leadership credibility. And George Marshall, we're told, uh, at least in some of the historical record, uh, told Eisenhower that if he did such a thing, uh, he would see to it that Eisenhower uh, was no longer in influence and authority. I don't know if that exchange ever took place. I don't know if there was uh, adultery in the classic sense, but I do know there was every appearance of it, and Eisenhower bears full responsibility for a relationship that never should have happened. And, uh, and, and then you, you, you talk about his, his wife's issues and difficulties. It, it, she, she was resentful, uh, jealous, we understand that, and, and look, she spent lots of time with Ike distant from her, and they, they largely communicated by letter. Uh, Eisenhower seems to have done have taken action to try to remedy that situation shortly after winning the victory, uh, bringing Mamie with him uh, to Europe, ending their relationship with Kay Summersby. But you know, Dwight, uh, and, and so I, I have to put Eisenhower in a different class in this sense than someone like JFK, John F. Kennedy, who we now know had uh, more adulterous and premarital uh, affairs than I can count, including when he was in the White House and all the rest. Th this is not on the same scale, but as a Christian, I have to say this was definitely sin and needs to be addressed as such. And uh, it has to be a blight on Eisenhower's life. Uh, I'm thankful it was not a lifelong pattern. Uh, there's no evidence it was a lifelong pattern, either before World War II or after, and certainly not in the White House. Um, so, you know, the fact we're having this discussion is uh, an indication of the legacy of sin. I'm not even sure what exact sin it was, except it was certainly a sin against his marriage uh, and a sin against his own reputation. And so here we are talking about Dwight Eisenhower's leader, and there it is. But here's something else, uh, you know, just uh, Dwight thinking about this. It'd be impossible to be JFK in the White House today. In the age of social media and with different rules by the media, uh, the media covered, reporters covered for John F. Kennedy and his adultery, sneaking women into the White House at night. Uh, that wouldn't happen today. Uh, there, the, the coverage would be there. And uh, so it would be a, a different thing entirely. Douglas from Charlotte, where would I rank Eisenhower among presidents? You know, uh, this is where, and, and you may remember that Bill Clinton, who I would not rank very high, uh, Bill Clinton complained. He said, there never was a great crisis so that I could be a great president. Uh, a little bit of narcissism in that probably, but there's a sense in which what he said was true. I mean, if, if, uh, if Eisenhower had not lived the life he did, and if the 50s had not been as strategic as they were, and if the Cold War hadn't been the threat that it was, then maybe we wouldn't be talking about Eisenhower as a great leader. But the fact is, all those things came at one moment. And again, to me, it's just, I, I, as a Christian, I have to look at history with a providential understanding. In God's providence, Ike didn't leave, frustrated the army after 16 years as a major. Uh, he was the right man at the right time. He was there. He, in retrospect, you can connect all the dots and say that's what made Ike Ike. Uh, there's a sense in which you have to look at American presidents and say it takes great leadership at a greatly momentous time. And because I think in retrospect the 50s were so crucial, I'd put Eisenhower, and, and because look, just I go back to the fact that there's so few successful presidents who served two terms and are as popular leaving as they were coming in. That's, that's just an amazing thing. So he has to rank in political skill uh, and in historical significance, certainly in the top 10 of American presidents. But, uh, but when I do that, I just want to say, Douglas, that doesn't mean he's my favorite in my top 10 favorites. Uh, because I think, you know, if we're honest, we're looking at figures from history, there are reasons of personality and, uh, and interest that may make us, you know, feel a little even closer to certain people than to others. One of the problems with Ike is he's a pretty remote figure. Like I say, it's, it's, to me, as a leader, it's one of the 
greatest quandaries of leadership. How can you so dominate a period that you did so when no one noticed it until a generation later? That's something. So uh, thank you for the question. John, last question today. How does one prepare to be ready to show virtues when they're called upon? I seem to have the virtues necessary the moments that were needed. What does one do to prepare for those moments? Well, what a great question, John. But I, I just have to assume this. Eisenhower was courageous when no one knew it and no one had opportunity to see it. Eisenhower had the virtues of honesty uh, long before um, you had someone like uh, Douglas MacArthur or Franklin Roosevelt or Winston Churchill or George Marshall had to take him at his word and when the history's hanging in the balance. Uh, but it, it showed up. I have to believe that uh, having those Bible readings in the morning and in the evening in that home when he was growing up was uh, one of seven boys had to have some impact on him. And, uh, you know, this is where we as Christians understand that the virtues don't come out of a vacuum. Uh, they come out of moral formation. And that's what the church is about. We call it discipleship. It's, it's, it's the, it comes by the ordinary means of grace and the preaching of the Word of God. But none of us knows how courageous we are until we have to be. If we're honest. Uh, I think we're all courageous in our imagination. The difference is, are we courageous at the moment? Uh, virtues of honesty, they have to be pre-commitments but we need to be honest. We've got to pray that in ourselves, as in others, the virtues will show up at just the right time uh, in just the right measure. What an honor to uh, think with you today about the uh, life and legacy of uh, Dwight Eisenhower. The whole point in leaders thinking about leaders is what Fox Connor taught Ike. And that is you learn it from others in order to hopefully see the right leadership in yourself and in those you influence. Maybe so for all of us. God bless you. Thank you again for joining us for this leadership briefing.